Glad to be here this morning. It's a beautiful day. It's been a beautiful weekend. I hope that you came to worship this morning with full baskets. Not empty baskets to be filled, but full baskets to offer to God in your worship. 2 Kings chapter 6 will introduce our thoughts. I'm really not going to preach from 2 Kings. I'm not going to preach from the Old Testament, really. Um, we're going to stay mostly in the book of Revelation this morning. And I just want to prepare our minds with something that really sets the tone for the message. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there's this story. It's a really fantastic story. I've not ever told it in a Bible story yet. I should. Maybe that'll be the next one I tell. But uh, it's where Elisha, not Elijah, he was the first of the mighty miracle working prophets of the E's, Elijah, and then Elisha comes on the scene. And the king of, of Syria has uh, opposed the nation of Israel and he's intimidating them. And for somehow he keeps getting defeated in battle and he asks who is responsible, who's in my inner committee that's leaking news to the Israelites. And he says, one of his servants says, it's none other than the, your, the servant of Elisha of the king of Israel. And so he sends a whole army to kill one man, essentially. And it says here, there's Elisha and his servant in, um, let's see, your second Kings chapter six. I want to start reading at verse 14. An army has been sent from the king of Syria surrounding them. It says, therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so this servant, you know, he's not as experienced as Elisha in the power of God. And he's just bewildered as any of us would be at the, what seems like reality before him. And so picking up at verse 16, so Elisha answered, don't fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And what seemed like reality was not reality. And what seems like reality with your eyes is not reality. Reality is what's really the spiritual forces at work, bad and good. And this morning we want to see what John sees in the book of Revelation the same spiritual reality and he uses the number seven and other symbols to help bring this to our realization in the apocalypse as it's sometimes called. This morning we're going to study that, um, the idea of seeing the spiritual world around us in a sermon I've called the number seven in John's Revelation. This morning I'll go through four major points this, uh, this morning. <laughs> We're going to talk about the number seven and how this is actually a very important number and has great significance in the whole Bible, really, especially the book of Revelation. I want to present to you what the scriptures, by using this number, present to us as the problem with our Christian perspective sometimes, or maybe I should say our earthly perspective, and then we'll talk about what is the cure to that problem. The number seven in scripture, and I'm not going to put um, everything I'm going to say up in the PowerPoint, but I will share most of the scriptures. We're going to do a lot of scripture reading this morning. Share most of them on the PowerPoint, and then I have a couple of lists here, just the beginning, that I want to share with you, make it a little easier for your visual. The number seven in scripture is, like I said, a very special number. It's used a lot, and if you were to really pay attention, now that I've told you, go and do your Bible reading every morning and start paying attention for every time that this number pops up, and I'll make a few comments on this in just a little bit, you'll find that it pops up a lot. Not every occasion is it being used in a symbolic sense or in a, well, in a significant sense, we might say. It's just simply reporting factual numbers sometimes. But nonetheless, you'll see this number pop up a lot. In Genesis chapter 2, of course, um, I don't have this on here. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, God blesses the seventh day of creation. And he sets that day apart specially. And it, it was, uh, in this sense, used in a significant way. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15, whenever... Uh, Cain was cursed by God for killing his brother Abel. God protected Cain and said, whoever takes vengeance on Cain, let it be carried out on that person, vengeance on that person, sevenfold. And he used that number in a significant way. In Ch Genesis chapter 7 and verses 2 through 3, Noah was to take seven of each clean animal onto the ark. In Genesis chapter 47, in the vision to Joseph of the plague or the famine of Egypt, there was going to be 40... <laughs> Sorry, there was going to be seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. 
In Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 8, I will read this one with you. It says, And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourselves, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty-nine years. <laughs> That's a lot of sevens. Uh, just to give you an idea there of, of a lot of them all in a row. Second Samuel chapter 21 is an interesting scene where David has is going to offer a peace treaty to the Gibeonites who are disdained by King Saul in his life. And in order to quell the wrath of the Gibeon king, Gibeonite king, uh, he offers seven sons of Saul. Now Saul had more than seven sons alive. In fact, he leaves out Mephibosheth, who he had smiled upon. But he, he offers seven sons and he hangs them in public to, uh, to resolve the issues between the two nations. Is it a question of... Why did he choose seven? I don't think there is once you realize the significance to this number, as we'll get into it. And then finally, if you look in the book of Revelation itself, there's a whole slew here, and this is in all of the occasions where the number is used, but it shows distinct ways it's used. Seven letters to seven churches. There are seven seals. There are seven trumpets. Seven angels blow the seven trumpet blasts in chapter 8. There are seven thunders from heaven, seven bowls of wrath, seven angels pouring out the seven bowls, seven spirits before the throne of Jesus. Um, seven stars, seven lampstands, seven kings in chapter 17, seven mountains that the harlot sits upon, seven eyes and seven horns on the Lamb of God, and seven diadems on the dragon's head in chapter 12. Now, that should at least convey to you the fact that this number is being used in more than just a literal way as an Arabic numeral to signify uh, actual events that occurred. It's being used many times here in symbolic ways to show special meaning. Now, let's get into that special meaning. Uh, Brother Ed has talked on the book of Revelation extensively, and he's still talking on it. This will be complimentary, hopefully, to what he's been teaching. And he has shared with us the idea that this number is used to show completeness, to show sometimes perfection in an identity group or a, a being. Like, for example, when it's used as seven diadems on the dragon's head, the idea there is perhaps a complete power, complete uh, evil. Or uh, something to that nature. Uh, John James Resegway says seven is a number associated with completeness, plenitude, or perfection. And I think if you think of it in that light, when it is being used symbolically, that will capture the message being presented by John. Also, I thought uh, what Michael Wilcock had to say was very helpful. And that is that while this number does relay completeness often, it also conveys the true nature or reality of a person, thing, or situation. And so, like I said before, um, whenever Elisha's servant said, what are we going to do? And he looks out, and reality is not what it seems like at first appearance. Well, our Christian life, sometimes reality is not what it appears to be. And so in a poetic way to bring about what is spiritual reality behind the surface events of this life, John will use the number seven to bring out that aspect of just how evil Satan is and just how righteous and holy God is. And he'll attach this number to, for example, the seven spirits of God around his throne. Uh, there's only one Holy Spirit, but he describes them as seven. Why? It's not that there are actually seven Holy Spirits. It's because the Holy Spirit is a perfect and complete being in the presence of God, the Father. And so that's an example of what he means by this. And so John uses this seven number and allows his reader to understand the true nature of God, Satan, and the spiritual reality of life as we know it. So hopefully that little description helps you a little bit. And that'll be borne out. Um, I do want to be clear, though, from the beginning. Because I've given this sermon a few times, and I don't know if I've ever given the same version of it twice. Uh, I always refine it because I find that people misunderstand something I say. So I have to tweak it a little bit. And one thing I've learned is sometimes people walk away from this message and perhaps the book of Revelation uh, thinking that every time the number is used, as I said before, that it's always being used in a figurative sense. That's not what I'm saying. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. I just mentioned in Revelation 5 and verse 6, there's the seven spirits of God around the throne of God. It's being used figuratively again. Not seven Holy Spirits, but one, represented by the number seven. It is used literally in Revelation chapter 1, the same book in verse 10, where Jesus says, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, there were seven literal churches in Asia. In fact, there are more than seven churches in Asia. If you know much about the geography of Asia Minor, the Church of Colossae, which has its own epistle written to it, is not listed in the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. There were more than seven churches, but he chose seven literal churches, I believe representatively of the church at large across the whole known world. 
Uh, but nonetheless, there were seven literal churches. And again, there were seven literal sons of Saul that were killed in 2 Samuel. Uh, and they were executed to bring about justice. And so I do want to get that point out there right away. And if you're asking how do we know whether to interpret it figuratively or whether to interpret it literally, the question you should first ask yourself is what type of, of literature am I reading in the Bible? Because the Bible is made up of many different types of literature. Uh, the book of Revelation is known as prophecy. And in prophecy, the first thing that you're going to assume is that a number is probably going to be figurative in nature unless there is good evidence or good reason why it should be taken literally. And if I'm reading a book of history like 2 Samuel, then I'm going to, because of its type of literature that it is, I'm going to assume that if the number seven is used, it's a literal uh, number being employed by the writer. Unless it just doesn't make sense, and then we can safely interpret it as a symbolic use. Sometimes poetry will pop up in books of history, and that again will be alerted to you because the editors will often, they'll indent it, they'll italicize it for you, they'll even put it in a column reference that tells you this is coming from Psalms, which is a whole uh, series of, of songs of poetry. And so those are a couple of different tips. Just look at what type of book you're reading. And in the book of Revelation, many people will take the book of Revelation literally, and they break the first rule of interpretation that in books of prophecy, we should assume that this is figurative language being employed primarily. And so that should help you just a little bit. Now, um, I've talked about, I've referenced at least, that we have a problem in our Christian life. And that problem is that we, we look out and we don't see sin for what it really is. And maybe we, that manifests itself in our lives. Because we let sin dwell in our lives um, and we let it dwell there uncontested. Sometimes we, we let sin go on around us in a complacent way and we don't ever say anything about it because perhaps we don't realize it's not always at the forefront of our minds the spiritual struggle, struggle that is at play in our own lives and in the whole world. And so this is a problem. It's a problem because of blindness. But when we get around, you know, when you're surrounded by worldliness all day, every day, it's very easy to become spiritually blind to these things. And as a result, you become spiritually complacent. And it's very difficult to wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do when you look in the mirror, and it's a scary sight, the first thing you're thinking is that it's a scary sight in the mirror. What you're typically not thinking is that Christ is reigning on his throne right now. Are you? You ever woken up in the morning, and that's the first thing that crossed your mind? And then maybe you turn on the TV, and something of a lustful nature comes across the screen or some vile words are spoken about God and the first thing you think is that the devil is like a dragon sweeping through the air, seeking whom he may devour, waiting around on the corner for you. It's typically not what you're thinking when you turn on the remote. And so when you see when we're surrounded by all this all the time, you think once or twice somebody, um, you know, poses temptation before you and, and you, you're alert to that. But when it happens all the time, and when we're just saturated in a worldly environment, it becomes very easy to become complacent to this reality around us. And we start to think that what is before us is the reality. Okay? So hopefully we'll be able to address that problem as we go along. Now, what I want to do at this time is I want to read to us. I said we read a lot of scripture. We're going to read a lot of scripture now. And I'll put, the readings are rather lengthy at times, so I'm going to put them on the PowerPoint. And these scriptures are very enlightening once you realize what's being talked about. The first time I read these verses... Uh, without having really studied figurative symbolic language in the book of Revelation, they didn't actually uh, read to me what they were actually saying, I guess, in, in figurative language. And they helped bring about the idea of what's going on when we actually sin. What's going on in a spiritual sense? And how does God see it? If we could see with God's eyes your life right now, then it might be very different than what we're seeing with our eyes. So the first passage I want to read, and the first thought I want to get across to you is that in the Bible, in the books of prophecy and poetry, a lot of times, sin is described in terms of harlotry. Harlotry being an old English term for prostitution. And a lot of times the prophets will call out judgments on the nations and Israel because they are like a harlot. 
and I say like a harlot, sometimes they were actually engaging in ritual sexual immorality that was just debased and immoral. And it was sexual immorality. But many times what he was rebuking was not necessarily physical sexual immorality, but he was describing their sin, which was of a truly different nature, as if it was harlotry. Because that's what God saw. They might have been seeing people who were extorting one another, and as a system, the nation was a, a nation of extortioners. But what God saw was a harlot. And I'll bring that to your attention in Isaiah chapter 23. In verse 1, this is actually a prophecy against the nation of Tyre as a nation. And it says there, going down to verse 8, Who is taking this counsel against Tyre? The crowning city whose merchants are princes, whose traders are the honorable of the earth. He's talking about those that deal in merchandise and selling and taking goods and exchanging monies for them. In verse 14, the Bible says, Wail you ships of Tarshish, one of the cities of Tyre, for your strength is laid waste. Now it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre will be forgotten seventy years, according to the days of one king. At the end of seventy years it will happen to Tyre, as in the song of the harlot. Take a harp, go about the city, you forgotten harlot. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may be remembered. And it shall be at the end of seventy years that the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her gain and her pay will be set apart for the Lord. It will not be treasured nor laid up, for her gain will be for those who dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for fine clothing. Now, if you were to read the whole prophecy in context, you again will learn that he's actually condemning extortion, extortion in the nation of Tyre. And that's the primary sin at play. But he's describing them as, you're a nation of harlots. And the money that you're making from your harlotry, eventually people are going to gain from that. Not you. And that's how wicked their sin had become, the sin of extortion. Another passage is in Nahum chapter 3, against the city of Nineveh of Assyria. Because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sell nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Now, there were more than women in the nation of Assyria. And he wasn't going to literally lift the skirts of the women over their faces. But he's using figurative language to... Tell them, I am going to shame you before all peoples when I bring you down to one of the lowest nations of the earth in judgment. Because of your harlotries, which was not actually harlotry, it was actually an economic injustice being carried out by their leaders and by the peoples at large. The next passage is in Ezekiel chapter 16. Now this is about the nation of Israel. And if you wanted to read a rated R chapter in the Bible, this would be it. It's a pretty graphic chapter in the Bible. It's pretty gross, the way that he describes the sins of Israel. I'm going to share with you a little bit uh, here in Ezekiel. Actually, I think I took it out, so I apologize. I took that slide out. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 16. I'll just have to read it to you, and you're welcome to turn along. Reading from the New King James. Um, and as you turn, I'll just give you some time here. He's talking about here, really, he's talking about compromise with the nations around them. In many different ways, not just sexual immorality, that compromise, but assimilating to the cultures around them in every way. And rather becoming more like God, becoming more like the pagan nations. But he describes them like this. Verse 16 of chapter 16. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them. And jumping down to verse 31. You erected shrines at the head of every road and built your high places in every street. You were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. Now, if you'll notice the first part of that, he's describing their idolatrous sacrifices, which may or may not have involved sexual immorality, as if they are committing harlotry against God. Um, he then says at the end of that verse that you're like a harlot, but see, most harlots, they take money from their customers, and you're actually paying people so that you can sleep with them. That's how wicked you are. <laughs> Because you get so much delight from your harlotry. So that you're willing to pay people to sleep with them. Verse 32, you're an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payment to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers. And hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. In that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you're the opposite. 
And, if, and he goes to describe them from how he selected them from when they were nothing, as if they were a child that was naked and, and wallowing in blood, if you back up a few verses. And then he made them a, a beautiful bride. And then they resorted after that to this debased harlotry. But that was what God saw when he saw this nation that he had chosen become a people like the nations around them in every way. Okay? In the book of Revelation, finally, we get now to the book of Revelation on this point, how God sees sin in terms of prostitution. It says in verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this beast, uh, he was very powerful. Very powerful is the idea. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, the colors of harlotry, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This is God's perspective of the devil and his agents of evil. And while we see, you know, trite sins and temptations, we'll call them, he doesn't see that. More specifically, he's talking about the evils that play in a martyr's world where the saints of Jesus, the last verse there, verse 6, are, are being killed by these agents of Satan. And it's not what it appears. It's actually a very gross scene. In verse 4 of chapter 18, going down some more, the same woman, the same harlot, Satan and his forces, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And so what this looks like in reality is you have Christians, and some of them were dying for their confession for Christ. But some of them were drinking of the sins and the cup of this great harlot, as he describes. And they were not <laughs> confessing Christ to the death. They were willing to compromise with the Roman culture around them for the sake of their life, for the sake of acceptance. But God says, be careful lest you share in her sins by drinking of her cup. It might seem safe in the moment, but it's truly an act of rank immorality. And so this is what it looks like whenever God's people are unfaithful to the covenant that we have entered into. You enter into a covenant in baptism. That's the point in time at which the covenant is sealed. The blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb is applied to your account. And from that time forward, God looks at you as one of his bride members, part of the bride. But then whenever we disregard that covenant that we've made, that's known as covenant unfaithfulness. And this is what God sees. You might see something different, but that's what God sees. The next thing I'd like to bring your attention is that in the book of Revelation, righteousness is viewed like virginity. And I'll have a comment on that in just a minute, but I just want to show you an example. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, to back up a little bit to the rest of the scripture, in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Bible says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. Again I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with tambourines, and you shall go forth into the dances of those who rejoice. In this verse, God is describing Israel as a chaste virgin. And if, I don't take for granted anymore that people understand what anything is. Uh, I've used the word eunuch many times, and people don't understand what a eunuch is. And I guarantee you, there's people that don't know what a virgin is nowadays, because they've probably never seen one. A virgin is somebody that does not have sex with another person until they're married, okay? That will be very clear. That's a virgin. And God is describing this pure woman as the nation of Israel after they entered into covenant relationship with him, before they had assimilated to the culture around them. This is what that covenant looked like. And he says he's currently prophesying to them in their captivity after they've been judged for this unchasteness that they've committed. And he says, I'm going to restore you to your virginity like you had before 
you entered in, or when you entered into covenant with me. In Revelation chapter 14, the same symbol, the same idea, is brought back to our attention about the people of God in the world of John. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb, this is Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, the people of God, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. The sound, or I'm sorry, the sand as it were, they sang as it were, that's a typo. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. I read all of that so you would understand we're talking about the people of God, the redeemed in all the earth of all time. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, when he says that, he doesn't necessarily mean all these women are virgins, all these people are virgins. Some of them were married and they lost their virginity in a righteous way. But nonetheless, when God sees them, they are like a chaste virgin who has never been um, lost their purity. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. To be a virgin to God is to be cleansed of your impurities and to be without fault because of the blood of the Lamb and your faithfulness to the Lamb. I've appealed to this already. I may have gotten ahead of myself, but uh, I thought y'all would appreciate this. You know what's more rare than a national championship at the University of Tennessee? A virgin. I, I mentioned that earlier. But I wanted to say that to you because I felt like some of y'all can connect to that. You understand uh, how difficult it is to find the first. Well, it's just as difficult in our society to find the second. And it wasn't really different in the times of Jesus. It wasn't different in the first century. We don't live in a different world. We live in the same world. It's the same dragon. It's the same lamb. It's the same harlot on a beast. It's just different time. And it's just as difficult to find a virgin today as it was in the times of John. But when God sees his people... Cleansed of all their sin, he sees a chaste bride ready to get married, or who has been married. And it's, it's just a glorious scene. And I want to read to you another scene in chapter 19, where it contrasts this woman, the people of God, with the harlot that we just read about in one succession. Revelation chapter 19 in verse 1. The Bible says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And so the agents of Satan will be judged one day, and Christ will be victorious, even though right now it doesn't seem that way, especially in the world that John lived in. But they will be avenged. Again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen and Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you as servants and those who fear him, both small and great. Now that's the harlot. And in the next verse, he talks back again about his bride. He says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice in giving glory, for the marriage of a lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen, I love it when he just tells you what the symbol is. He says the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And that's what God's people look like when they have been redeemed and they realize they have been redeemed of vile acts and they are his holy bride. A holy virgin wife dressed in fine linen, clean and radiating with no deceit and no filth found in her. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want to pursue that in faithfulness to God. And so we have to remove all the, I'll call them spiritual cataracts. The cat cataracts are gross in your eye that cause you to see dimly, eventually maybe lose your full sight. Some of you have had cataract surgery. And I, I just, just imagine, 
I, I, I've never lost my sight. I just can imagine when they finally do surgery to remove cataract and you finally see for the first time just the clarity and the joy that must be to see again, you know, after all, the blindness. And we need some cataract surgery from our spiritual eyes that keep us from seeing the reality around us. Instead of a mere man, John sees Christ as he really is, a king. He has seven horns and seven eyes. He is all-powerful, all-seeing, victoriously riding on his white horse to make war in Revelation chapter 19. Instead of a harmless sheep or an angel of light, as Paul describes the devil, John sees Satan for what he really is, an ugly and a dangerous red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, very powerful, ready to devour the children of God, as in Revelation 12. That's what he sees. And instead of um, just, as we sometimes say, the church, and we just call it the church, and we move on, John sees the very bride of Christ, pure and radiating in glory. Not to be relegated to some secondary affection to the redeemed, but of premier importance. And John sees Satan's agents of sin, not as innocent trifles to peddle with, but as a vile prostitute sitting on a horrific beast, inviting the masses into a brothel of filth. That's what John sees whenever you're invited to partake of Satan and his company's lusts and temptations. And so I ask you this morning to examine your life, and if God could look at your life right now, what would he see? What kind of garments are you wearing? Are you wearing purple and scarlet? Or are you wearing glistening white? Not because of some righteous acts that you have done to atone for your sins, because there's not enough righteous acts you could do to atone for all of the purple and scarlet in your life. But does he see the blood of the Lamb... That is adorning you because you have committed yourself in faithfulness to the king. See, that's how you look listening white again. Even if you are no longer a virgin. And you have lost your virginity physically. Uh, and, and you have become impure physically or spiritually in some way. You can become that glistening white again. Anybody can. I don't want you to lose the point of the message today. You can become glistening white again. The righteous acts of the saints. Paul, uh, John describes it. And so what kind of clothes are you wearing? I want to finish up by reading Matthew chapter 22. And turn with me over here. In keeping with the language of John that he's been describing the church as the redeemed of God. Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 through 14. We'll be done after this passage in just a couple of comments. Matthew chapter 22 and Jesus is describing what it will be like when he comes again. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. And went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed th those murderers, and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how do you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so are you wearing your wedding garments today? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Because he can come at any time. And the application of all this is to stop making excuses for the sin that you continue to indulge in. There's a difference between sinning and regretting you sinned and stopping that. And even you do it again 
And you, again, you regret that you sin, and you stop that, and you continue to build roadblocks in place to keep that from happening. And it will take time, some sins more than others, and indulging in the sin. Where you sin, and you're like, well, it's just a little sin. Or, you know, I, I've seen Danny do a lot worse. And you start comparing yourselves to other people. Stop making excuses for the sin in your life. A lot of us do that. Because we can't see Christ on his throne at the moment. And so we make excuses for it. And we can't see the dragon, Satan, flying about, as it were. And obviously he's not a literal dragon. Obviously he's not literally flying about. You get the idea. But he's very real. And his lusts and temptations are very real. And we'll use the word temptation to water it down. I was tempted or I'm struggling with something. Stop making excuses. I'm talking to myself as well. Stop using God's grace as some kind of sorcery to make your sin less sinful. And think that because you've been saved as a past event in time, and you understand God's grace, we'll just use it to make that indulging sin in our life less sinful. It's not some kind of sorcery that you can just wave about like a wand. Live by faithfulness to the king who has bought you, and he has loved you, and he has cleansed you, and he continue, continues to cleanse you. And he is riding on a white horse, coming in victory one day, and he's going to name names. He's taking lists. And it doesn't matter if you've been saved in a past event. You can still make it on the list. And answer honestly, how does God see you this morning? And if you're not ready to meet Jesus today and you're not wearing the right garments, then put your trust in him. Put your faithfulness in him and become white again and be saved.